the right is. Right, Gene? It's a reality, man. <laughs> Gene says, speak for yourself. All right. <laughs> All right. If you have your Bibles, turn to James chapter 1. And if you remember, we're going through uh, the book of James. I guess it would be a series on the book of James. And uh, we started two weeks ago with the introduction. And last week we talked about his greeting and how he mentions that he's a bond servant. And he mentions that not if, but when we go through trials and when we go through troubles, that we should count it all as joy. So we know that when we give our life to Jesus Christ, when we go get baptized, the enemy is waiting, waiting. And how many of you know that Satan is real, number one, he's real. But number two, that he's not our only enemy. We actually have three enemies. We have Satan, we have the world, and then we have this flesh, this body that we live in. And all three crave and desperately work hard to achieve everything that will destroy us. Usually starts with a promise that's a lie. We begin to chase it, we begin to chase it. Sin, the disease, all that stuff is progressive. And then when we get down the road, we say, well, that's it. I'm done. I think I'm going to stop now. And then whatever it is you're doing says, uh, excuse me, no, you can't stop. <laughs> we're going to ride this one out till the wheels fall. I said, well, the wheels fell off two years ago. No, but we're going to keep going. <laughs> we're going to keep going. We're going to run it into the dirt. And that's the way life without Jesus Christ works. It's all automatic. It just happens that way. And so then we come to the Lord and the Lord in His grace, He reaches down, pulls us up, right? Saves us, turns our life around. Uh, and then the enemy being relentless the way that it is, he don't stop. Now, be sure that I'm not talking about, and James is not talking about the problems that we cause for ourselves when we step out of God's will. People say, oh, I'm going through trials, I'm going through difficulties, I'm going through temptations. You say, what's going on? Well, you know, but sounds to me like you caused all that yourself. And if you're like me, sometimes Satan doesn't have to do nothing but sit on his recliner. I'll destroy myself all by myself. I have a plan for my life. And so that's what happens. God has a plan for our lives. We have a plan for our lives. We go that way. And, but then God... Then God, then Jesus forgives. And some people don't like that. But He forgives. Even people like myself. Even people like all of us. And so that's why we say that our God, the God of the Bible, is the God of second chances, and third chances, and four chances. And it goes on and on. There is a time, though, the Bible says, when a lion is drawn, where? We don't know. When it's drawn, we don't know. But when we cross that line, the book of Romans says, then we enter into a realm of what the Bible calls a reprobate mind. And there's no coming back. I promise you that none of us have that going on. Because those people will never enter into a church again. They run away from God with all their might. But I have to tell you, and the Bible tells us, there is that time and there is that place. Right? So we want to guard ourselves from that. But now, in verses 9 through 16, chapter 1, the book of James, James now wants to encourage us when we go through the trials, and he wants to remind us of the vanity of worldly wealth. The vanity of worldly wealth to tell us how, and, and also to tell us where and how and when, not when, but how and where trials come from. And I'll tell you the truth. If nothing else, my life has been very, very interesting. And as I was studying this, I was thinking, I was considering um, the years, my younger years. You know, both of my, my mother and my father were in the real estate business. And um, they were in the real estate. They continue to be in real estate, actually. But in the 70s and the 80s, and part of the good part of the 90s, they were working in real estate offices in Beverly, on Beverly Boulevard in Montevallo, where all the real estate offices were at, at the time. And I saw so much ambition, worldly ambition, envy, greed, corruption, 
I saw so much of that. And I saw men rise from nothing to become multi-millionaires. I'm not exaggerating. I mean it literally. Literally. And I've seen them gain fortunes and lose fortunes and then gain fortunes again. And unfortunately, because they invested that, because they allowed that to be part of their identity, because they chased it with all of their flesh and all of what the world, or the lies I should say, that the world offers, they lose it. And if you stand back and you see it for what it is, it's very foolish actually that they spend so much time and resources and years pursuing that only to forfeit it by utter stupidity. Utter stupidity. I mean, uh, you know, having affairs when they're married, bad investments, greed, economy, when the economy is good, when the economy is bad, over leveraging, spending more than they make. Oh, that. My father used to work in a really big office over there. And on Fridays, some of the younger guys, right, they would come over in their Hugo Boss suits and like that. And they would tell my father, hey, Joe, can you spot me five grand until Wednesday? I got a deal closing on Wednesday. I'll give you back 5,500. And my dad would say, oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Sign the little paper right here. He said, <laughs> and then they would give him the five grand. And they would use it to go out of town, to buy a Rolex watch, to buy things that they couldn't afford. You know why? Because they believed it when the world says, if you don't have those things, you don't matter. One, one day I was coming, uh, I was using at the time, it was in the 80s, and I was going down Beverly Boulevard, and uh, I was going to, to, to cop. And on Garfield and Beverly, the Department of Justice, FBI, ATF, and ICE, they had the, uh, the, the road blocked. And they had it blocked, if you know that area, all the way from Garfield to Findlay. And to the sheriffs too, and the helicopter that, 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 that was going. And I said, oh no, they busted my connection, right? <laughs> and then I said, no, these guys, all these people wouldn't have showed up for my connection. And it dawned on me. They came from my Nino. They busted my Nino. And they did. He made a lot of money, but it wasn't enough. So he started money laundering. And he started dealing with all those people. And he got busted. And he didn't need to do that. Later on, you guys who know Kilroy, Kilroy's brother, strategically, <laughs> he bought the bar on Whittier Boulevard, on Whittier and Garfield. Right? Name was Dan Dan. He called the bar Mr. D's. <laughs> and I, I don't know, I'm not going to, you know, I, I guess he saw opportunity, so he bought, the, and all the real estate guys used to go to that bar and have a few beers. They had no idea what they were getting into. But the things that happened, as you can imagine, in that place, with that combination, you know, and so, you know, I just saw all of these things growing up and, and God protected me through all of that and that's why I'm here today. But I saw and all of that came to my mind when I was studying the scriptures right here because what James is talking about right here is the vanity of worldly wealth. And he never says that it's not good, that it's not okay. I, I don't want anybody to be, walk out of here saying, well, Mario said that God doesn't like wealthy people. That's not the case at all, Right? But there are some things that James talks about here. So if you have your Bibles, go to James chapter 1, and we're going to pick it up on verse 9, and we're going to go through ver to verse 15. Everybody there? Yeah. All right. It says, Believers who are poor have something to boast about, for God has honored them, and those who are rich should boast that God has humbled them. They will fade away like a flower in the field, the hot sun rises and the grass withers. The little flower droops and falls and its beauty fades away. In the same way, the rich will fade away with all of their achievements. God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Adversity, right? Afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love Him. And remember, when you are being tempted, do not say, God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong and He never tempts anyone else. Temptation comes from our own desires which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions 
And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would just unpack this yourself, that your Holy Spirit would speak and teach all the ears and all the eyes that made the sacrifice to be here tonight. Father, have your way in our lives. Tell us what you mean by all of this and tell us how it applies to each one of our lives individually. We look to you now for that in Jesus' name. Amen. So since money or the mishandling of money is the source of so many trials. You know, I heard it, actually as I say, I heard it before, but I've heard it many times. That finances or trouble in the area of finances are the number one problems with marriages today. The husband and the wife fighting over money. Right? And most of that comes from overspending. And that's what Americans are just made of that stuff. Credit card. Right? Credit card. We love them. Love hate relationship, right? And so James right here is talking about the difference between the rich and the poor and where they put their faith. The rich and the poor and where they put their faith. And it's been said, I don't know who said it, but somebody said that the poor brother forgets all his earthly poverty as the rich brother forgets all his earthly riches. Right? The poor brother forgets all his earthly poverty as the rich brother forgets all his earthly riches. Why? Because by faith and through trials, the two become equal, don't they? And in the church, in God's eyes, as part of the body of Christ, we're all equal, aren't we? I can't even remember how many times the church that I came from, big church, thousands of people there. How many times the little, poor, humble guy was praying over the wealthy guy who was on his knees. And the wealthy guy was all disturbed and jacked up because something with family, health, or finances, something. And the little poor guy was praying over him, anointing him with oil, trying to encourage him. Because in this world, who really has all the wealth? The guy with the money or the guy who's spiritually fat? The guy who's spiritually fat because the money's temporal. The money's temporal, right? And so... What happens then is God is no respecter of person. It's like the guy who is worth $50 million. And he's got all the money in the bank and he's got everything that all that money can buy. And then some little big mouth guy comes and he just scored on 500 bucks. And he's bragging like, oh, get a 500. Baby. The horse races, I know how to pick up. And the guy with $50 million says, this guy's ridiculous. Why? He's got so much money. Well, God has all the money in the world. The Bible says that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. The Bible says that God owns the universe and everything that's in it. It doesn't matter to Him who has money. It's nothing to Him. In fact, in the book of Revelation, it says that the main street, the main boulevard of heaven, that that street is paved with solid gold. Pure gold. The purest gold that actually says so God doesn't respect some man or woman. You and I might that have money, right? We might, oh, wow, you, right? God says, I don't, that guy's a peon next to me. Means nothing, right? And so it's just as appropriate for the poor to celebrate when they're being blessed because the poor come from the bottom up, don't they? Right? So it's as appropriate for them to celebrate when they're being blessed as it is for the wealthy to celebrate when they're being brought to humility by trials. But that's more difficult, isn't it? Because where that's concerned, it's more difficult to go from the top to the bottom where humility is than to start from humility and have God bring you up. But God says, that's the way it is. Where my people are concerned, those that are high and mighty got to be brought down. And those who are lowly got to be brought up. And now I have my church family. Right? That's the way it works spiritually. And so we would ask the question then, why is this God's rule for His people? Well, how many know that everything that is written in the Bible is written there so that you don't go hurt yourself? Because if you're like me, you're just prone. You can't help it. I cannot take health and wealth and success for more than three days. I got to mess something up. I, I, did, I have to, I can't even help it. I mean, if society really knew me, I might be in a straitjacket. 
Like why did this why does he keep doing that? Any answer? I don't know. <laughs> it's just it's gotten to the place where it's just familiar territory now, right? And if I'm away from there for too long, I don't know how to act. I'm, I'm, I I want to overcome that at some point, but uh, so when God talks about you know being the high and mighty being brought down and the, the lowly being brought up, right? The reason that that is is because it keeps His people from putting their faith and trust and identity in wealth that comes and goes. That's the problem, isn't it? That's why the high and mighty guy ought to be real careful about his actions and how he speaks and how he brags and the choices that he makes. Because that might, you know, in this country, I discovered watching those people and even my father, it's not hard to go out and make a lot of money. Did you know that? A lot of, oh, you know, I, I don't. Listen, in this country, it's not hard. And if you come from one of those other countries where people are starving, you come here and you see nothing but opportunity, and you say, man, I'm going to go get some little fruit stands, or I'm gonna do, and I'm going to work my fingers, and you will have money. I remember, I forget how much it was, but somebody said how much the owner of King Taco was worth when he died. Made his money making tacos. Guy came from Mexico. He was super, super wealthy. Anybody can do that. But not everybody can hold on to it. That's the problem. That's why we have bankruptcy. Right? And so in Proverbs chapter 23 verse 5. It says in the blink of an eye wealth disappears. For it will grow wings and fly away like an eagle. See you later. Been nice knowing you. We had a wonderful relationship. But now I'm going to somebody else's wallet. That's the way it works. That's the way it works. And we don't know why and we don't know when, but it happens over and over and over again, doesn't it? Even Donald Trump was on the verge of bankruptcy. I was watching a program on that guy. There came a time when he was inches away from losing everything. It could happen to anybody. It doesn't matter how smart or how talented you are or are not. Right? That's the way it happens. And so then James gives us an illustration of this. Look what he says in verse 10 again. It says, and those who are rich should boast that God has humbled them. How often do we hear rich people, successful people, talking about how God has humbled them? Lately, I know one, our vice president, Mike Pence. He always talks about how humbled he is that God would choose him for that position. I don't know the guy, I don't know if it's true, but he says the right thing, right? And so... It says, the hot sun rises and the grass withers. The little flower droops and falls and its beauty fades away. In the same way, the rich will fade away with all their achievements. And so trials remind the poor, what? That they're rich eternally, right? And then they remind the wealthy that while they're comfortable in this life, hey, listen, it's a short life. It's a short life, right? And it fades like the grass and falls like the flower after the spring. Listen, you know, the Jews are God's chosen people. That's what the Bible says. And Israel, the land of Israel, is God's chosen land. In fact, the Bible says that when Jesus Christ returns, He's going to rule from King David's throne from Jerusalem for 1,000 years. That's what the Bible says. And so Israel is a land chosen by God since Abraham's day. Do you know that even Israel goes through seasons? I've been there in the spring, and I've been there in the fall. And if you go to Israel in the spring, green grass is just everywhere. I mean, flowers, multicolored flowers seem to be growing out of the rocks. And if you go to the north, where the Sea of Galilee is, it's surrounded by all these soft rolling hills. And in the spring, it's like a big green blanket, but like a quilt, because a patch over there, and, a, and I mean huge patches. There's like a purple, and a pink, and a green, and a blue, and there are all these flower patches. They're everywhere, right? But come fall, everything is as brown as that wall. Everything. And so we know that if God's land goes through seasons, we also go through seasons. That's just the way that it is. And there's a time to accumulate wealth, and then there's a time to pay off debt, and then there's a time to work, and then there's a time where you get the pink notice that you're getting laid off. So if we put our trust 
in material wealth, we're going to be gravely disappointed. And for those of us in recovery, how many do you know, as I know, that lost it all in recovery and next thing you hear is that they've relapsed? And I say, what happened? And I say, I know what happened. Their wealth and success became their identity, not recovery. The wealth and success almost happened to me. And so there's nothing wrong with being rich, but put your faith, your trust, and your identity into eternal things that don't fade away. And if we do that, then when we die, guess what? We go to be with our riches eternally. Eternally. So Jesus said in Matthew 6 verse 19, Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Don't do that, he says. So here's what happens, you guys. What we invest in eternally, eternally, is waiting for us in heaven. In heaven, there's no bankruptcy. There are no seasons where riches come and riches go. It doesn't exist there. Everything is looking up every single day. And the way I read scripture, your investment there even earns interest. True story. Read the scripture and tell me if you don't find the same thing. And Jesus says, listen, where you have wealth in the world, anything can happen. You've already seen that. But nobody is going to take your wealth out of my hand. I am saving it for you. And so you want to know the truth of the matter? Put on your spiritual glasses now. Each one of us have a bank account in heaven. That's what the Bible says. That's what Jesus is saying. Some of us have a nickel in there because we're so consumed with this life and what I can have. Some of us are going to be super, super wealthy up there. That's a, I'm not making that up. That's a fact of the matter. Those who are going to be poverty stricken in heaven, they're going to be grateful that they're there. But they're going to look around. And they're going to say, well, I had it all for those few short years that I lived on earth. But I have nothing here. And this is forever. And it's going to be a sad day. How sad? Well, how sad are you when you look around and you see the guy who made it and you didn't? Multiply that by a thousand and ten thousand and a hundred thousand because you're in heaven forever. So this life is going to be all about what we do here to enjoy this life or what we do here to enjoy the next life. That's the reality of the Word of God, right? And so money and other things, he's saying, bring trials to anyone. But only God's people are rewarded for enduring the trials. Do we know that? You know, it rains on the good and it rains on the evil, doesn't it? The, the, the rain doesn't differentiate, right? And so do problems and so do trials. They'll fall on anybody. So I don't believe in God at all. Okay, but I see that you suffer just as much as I do. The difference is the one who suffers for Christ's sake has a very big reward in heaven. That's what the Bible says. And when you go to, don't go there now, you could write it down when you go home, you could read it. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, it refers to the Bema seat of Christ. B-E-M-A, Bema seat. The Bema seat is where you would go in ancient days, if you participated in the Greek Olympics, right? You were a track star, you came in first place. And then the judge or the emperor or whoever it was at the time would sit on the bema seat and you would approach it and they would put a crown on your head because you came in first place. You were the champion of that sport that you participated. That's the bema seat of Christ. Well, there is a bema seat of Christ in heaven and we're all going to go before that throne and we're going to be judged. Not whether we're saved or not. That's already been established. Thank God that is the one thing that I cannot screw up because I didn't earn it. And I can't keep it. It's what the Lord did for me that earned it. And what the Lord did for all of us. Right? Otherwise, who knows? I'm like, we, we, someone's capable of selling that thing. Right? <laughs> Truth be told. <laughs> so we're all saved. And it's not because of us. It's because of what He did. But this beam of seed of Christ is where we're all going to go to be judged for our works. For what we did. What did you invest? Right? And then it goes on to say that 
There's going to be a fire there. And God is going to take all of our works, throw it into the fire. And whatever survives the fire will be rewarded because that was done unselfishly and with the heart of the Holy Spirit. The other stuff that we did to brag or boast or whatever, to try to, um, to elevate ourselves, right? To get into some kind of powerful position. All that's going to burn and God says, that don't, that don't even count, right? The book of Revelation chapter 20, on the other hand, talks about the judgment seat of Christ. That's not our place. We're not going to be there. Those who reject the work that Jesus Christ did for them, they're showing up for that one. And basically, you can read it when you get home. I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. But God says, hey, what did you do in response to the work that my son did for you? Because John 3.16 says that he died for the whole world. And they're going to say, well, I, I was a good guy. And God's going to say, not good enough. See, I'm perfect. And if I allow one solitary flaw into my kingdom, that makes me imperfect. I've got to remain perfect for my people. Otherwise, I can't be their God. So what did you do? Well, you know, I used to mail money to that guy on television who helped the kids. Yeah, but what are we going to do about your sin? See, you owe a debt. You have nothing to pay it with. Oh, I have a lot of money. Your money doesn't mean anything here. Look at the street, man. Your money doesn't mean anything here. At the end of the day, the Bible says that all those people are going to be cast in to the lake of fire. Not because God hates them, not because He's mad at them, but because He cannot allow imperfection to come into the realm of perfection. It's just the way it is. And so He says that your life on earth, everything is open. Give your life to Jesus Christ. Confess that you're a sinner, that you need Him. And we're going to get the whole deal squared away. Very simple. But some people's rebellious heart won't allow them to do that. So we have the Bema seat where we're going to be rewarded or not. Or not, depending on what we invested into the kingdom. And then we have the white throne judgment where it's going to be decided where we go if we rejected Jesus Christ. And so, last week in verse 2, James said, When trouble of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy because it brings maturity. It brings Christian maturity to us, right? And then now, in verse 12, he says that God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. He says, afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love them. The crown of life that he promises to those who love him. Why does he say to those who love him? Because Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey me. Right? The Bible is all about doing what you believe, and believing what you're doing. It works hand in hand. Not just talking, right? And so if we can remember this, if we will believe this, we will celebrate when trials come. Not be down in the dumps. Those are the people that forget, right? But if we remember this, and if we believe it, we're going to celebrate when these trials or temptations come. And so if you don't remember this, if you don't believe this, it's because, here's the bad news. <laughs> you're not in church as often as you should be. You're not at Bible study. You're not with your Christian brothers and sisters in fellowship. And maybe you're not even serving in the church. Isn't that what we warn people about in our 12-step rooms? Keep coming back. Why? Because if you don't suckle, you're going to relapse. I'm paraphrasing. Right? <laughs> but isn't that the warning? We got to be present. We got to be participating. You can't isolate. You know what? Those are spiritual principles that came from the Bible. And so if we're not doing those things, then we remain on the outskirts. And when trials come, it's too late. You're not going to believe anything that me or James or any of you guys have to share. It's too late. You're already in the dumps. It's going to be a while now. And you're going to get, you know, dig yourself out. And so... It's all about doing because you will believe what you do and you will do what you believe. And that's what the book of James is all about. And that's why we gave you guys these blue wristbands today. Where's your wristband, Hoppo? Oh, you got to become a member, Holmes. Come on. All right. <laughs> and so now he's talking about how and from where do temptations and trials come? Because all too often, this is when people blame God. Have you guys ever blamed God? 
I blame God many, many... I am not kidding you. I'm not saying this to for any other reason but that it's true. Sometimes when I would wake up sick, and most of the time on Sundays, I don't know why the connections won't deal you something on Sundays, but they don't. I would wake up sick and I would blame and I would be angry at God because I would have to go through it. That's how sick and twisted and far removed I was from God. And so if you have ever come to that place in your life where you blame God, I understand completely. But it's not God's fault. It's another one of our misconceptions. Because the Bible says that temptation and trials, they don't come from God. Guess who has to take responsibility for those things? Me. Me. It's nobody. It's no person. It's no place. It's no thing. It's not even a disease. It's the choice that I made. That's what the Bible says. We have to take responsibility. And so it says that these things come from our own flesh. Or you could say our own selfish ambitions. In recovery they would say the disease. Right? And so this is the truth today. It began that way and it always will be. Let me remind you of Genesis chapter 3. Verses 3 uh, through 7. And they're going to put that up here right now. This is what happened in the beginning. This is the first time temptation and trouble came into the world. Had it not come in on this particular day, you and I would not be suffering the way that we do. Right? It says, she, that's Eve. You know who she is? You know who Eve is? Eve is your great-grandmother and my great-grandmother. Did you know that? And it's her fault that you and I were born into sin. Because if you recall, if you could think back far enough, you did not need to learn how to lie, did you? Nobody had to teach me that. I was born with it. Nobody had to teach me how to steal. I was born with it. Why? Because of my great-grandmother. That's the big deal about Jesus. He was not part of Eve's offspring. That's why the Virgin Mary remained a virgin after she gave birth to Him. He was not born into sin, right? And so look what it says. It says, She, Eve, saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious and she wanted the wisdom. In the the original Hebrew, the word there is sakel, which means intelligence. Eve wanted to be smart, selfish ambition, right? And that it would give to her. And so she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were opened, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. I can't get into all of this for lack of time. But it was human, selfish ambition that invited temptation, trials, and trouble into this world. And then look what happens next. Go down to verse 11, Genesis 3 verse 11. God approached them, Adam and Eve. He came down in the cool of the day, Bible says, and He says, Adam, Adam, where are you at? Come to fellowship with you, Adam, where are you at? And Adam and Eve were hiding. And God said, hey, why are you hiding? He said, well, we're naked. And God said, oh, no. Who told you you were naked? And the whole thing begins to unravel now. And so God in verse 11 says, who told you you were naked? And look what God says. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? And then look what happens. The man replied, It was the woman that you gave me who gave me the fruit. And I, I don't know how it happened, but I ate it. Blame. That's what we do, don't we? It was him. It was her. It was always her. But it's, you know, that, or, right? That's just corrupt human nature. We're not willing to take responsibility for anything sometimes. And that, so often, is the problem. And so after man's flesh or selfish ambition invites trouble, temptation, and trials into the world, man does his best to blame God. Why is this happening to me? Why did... Yeah! Right? And so that little game happened in the beginning. It happens today. And you know what the book of Revelation teaches us? That it's going to happen even in the future. The world is going to get together. You can see it coming together already. The world is going to get together and say, 
He is the problem. He is the root of the problem and the cause of all of this. If those Christians, Catholics, Christians, all of those people who believe that the Bible is true and that Jesus Christ is the only way, if they can just be removed from this world, this world will be at peace. And that's what's going to happen in the book of Revelation, the Bible tells us. The Christians are going to be removed. But the world's not going to be better. It's going to become more chaotic. That's, we read the book. We, we got the end of the story. We know how it ends, right? And so today, we know good from evil now, right? And our flesh, our selfish ambition, tempts us to give in to that loud, consistent voice. Am I the only one who hears that voice, or do you guys hear it too? When I'm driving, you know, I'm not going to share it with you guys, because I don't want to corrupt you, right? Nobody here is corrupt but me. But I know how to beat every single driving citation. I sat next to a paralegal one time in court. He says, you're going to be found guilty, but I'm not. I said, give me the game. This was about 15 years ago. I've gotten citations. I've got a lot of citations. I beat every single one of them. And so when I'm driving down the freeway in the diamond lane by myself, or I'm speeding, or I don't, I'm sweating coming from the gym and I don't want to wear my seatbelt, or I feel like talking on the phone, I just do it. And any cop, highway patrol, whoever, come on, bring it. Write up your little ticket. We'll see what happens. Right? Well, <laughs> what happens, that selfish, it's that voice that I hear. When in reality, God's word says, Mario, why don't you be an example, pastor? Why don't you be an example to people who maybe don't know any better? They're looking for a way. And why don't you be obedient to the law that I put in place? But the little voice, it doesn't shut up. You're better than that, Mario. You're special. <laughs> Does the voice tell you that you're special? <laughs> I thought I was the only one. Right? And so then what happens is we give in to the temptation, to the little voice. And then what does the voice say at the end of it all? Blame God. Why did this happen to me? This shouldn't happen. Mario, you're the one. You're the guy who can't go three days being blessed. The fourth day's got to be chaos. And you blame me. Right? That's what happened. So, same game being played out all the way from Genesis to today. And it's going to go on into the future. And it happens to the best of us, right? And so James, listen, knowing the Bible, knowing history, and knowing truth, he reminds us, when you are being tempted, do not say God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong and He never tempts anyone else. Temptation comes from our own desires which entice us and drag us away. So here's the deal, you guys. The answer to this is to change our desires. Right? If you, if you understood what we just read, what James wrote, the answer to all of this is to change our desire. To stop wanting what destroys us to stop wanting what is evil and corrupt? How do we do that? Is that not the million dollar question in your mind, in my mind? Or, or do you guys have it figured out? Listen, this is so simple. This is so easy. But our hearts are so dark and corrupt that we overlook it. Because if we want to change our desires... There's only one thing that we've got to do. We've got to protect the eyes and the ears. That's it. That's all we got to do. Because what goes in here and goes in here goes right to the heart and we become that. It drives me crazy when I see these young kids with the earbuds. I know what they're hearing. Get that B-I-T-C. And kill the police. And what is it doing to our youth? Right? Right? You guys are laughing. You can identify. That's what's going on there. And that breeds that kind of behavior, whether we like it or not, because this is a window into our heart. Right? And so in Job 31, verse 1, this guy, he, he, he made a deal with his eyes. He said, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look with lust at a young woman. I made a deal. I signed a contract with my eyes. You will not do that. And then in Romans chapter 10 verse 17, Paul said, Faith comes by hearing, and that is hearing the good news about Christ. 
These are the windows, the open windows into the heart. What you put in here and what you put in here is going to be what happens in here. So if we listen to Christian music, if we're into scripture... If we're into Christian fellowship, if we're serving at the church, you got to be in church. See, we, 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 we tricked a lot of you guys. By forcing you to take a commitment, we knew you'd show up. Right? So we manipulated some. With well, some of you guys, it didn't work. Worked for two weeks and then we, you guys grew wings and left. Right? <laughs> but if we're doing that kind of stuff, then this and this is going to get flooded with words of holy inspiration. And we're going to become that. Right, And so, that is going to determine whether we're living or dying on a day-to-day -day basis. So James says in verse 15, These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. That's what it says. So from this day forward, we get to choose. If you confessed that you're a sinner and that Christ is your Savior, then you're saved. But, Will you live a blessed life really trusting God and receiving the rewards that He has for you in heaven for all eternity? Or are we going to indulge in the things of this temporal world? That's the choice we have to make. And we can't say, well, I don't know what's going on anymore. No, we know now. It's the desires of our heart. And we got to own that. And we have the power to change it. It's very simple if we want to. So Mark raised up his... his Mark jokes around and he laughs until it's time to end the sermon. Then he looks at me with all that seriousness. Five, baby. Right? <laughs> so I'm going to close with this. In the book of Deuteronomy, I think it's chapter 11. Moses is about to die. God told him, Moses, pack it up. You're ready. We're taking you home. And so Moses has one more talk with all the Israelites. He gathers them together and he says, look, you guys. You are going into the promised land now. I can't go with you. God's not going to let me go. I got in trouble with God and I can't go. But you're going to go. He said, and so today, in my last speech to you, I leave before you both a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you will obey God and a curse if you don't. Is what Moses says. What a lot of people overlook is the fact that Moses said, because God said, you're going into the promised land. But are you going to be blessed or are you going to be cursed over there? You're going to the promised land. How does that speak to us New Testament people? You're saved. You confess Christ. You were baptized. You took of communion. You raised your hand one day and said, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Take my life. Live in me. You're saved. No doubt about it. But will you obey God and be blessed? Or will you disobey God and be cursed? It's like gravity. It's a spiritual law. If you jump off the building, you're going to break something. You can't say, no, damn it, I'm going to jump off the building and nothing will break. It won't make a difference. You're going to break bones. Spiritual laws are set in that same stone. If you disobey God, the end road is going to be a curse. And you can blame God all you want at that point. It's not going to change your circumstances. And all of your blaming is not going to be true. But man, if we obey. Wow. Wow. How many people do I know that are just so blessed? I mean, until they take their last breath. They got money in the bank to leave their grandchildren. They have beautiful homes. Their life is so spiritually filled. All of their children and grandchildren are saved. Their college graduates can go on and on. And it's ready to depart. They're ready to depart from the world. And they're going to a place where they're even more wealthy there. And then Christian people who die so bitter. I know I'm going to heaven. But poor Mijo, he's doing 10 years. And my wife left me for the guy. And I'm in the hospital. I'm dying by myself. And you say, why well, you got Jesus? I know, but man. <laughs> and when they get to heaven, they're going to be paupers or poverty people. They'll be in heaven. They're saved. The people got to the promised land. But how will you live when you get there? Doesn't matter how talented or how smart you are or your resources. Doesn't matter. All that stuff grows wings and flies away. But if we put our faith and all of our interest into God and His Word, we're going to be so blessed. Right? Mark's about ready to throw something at me. So I'm going to end now. <laughs>
We're going to close with a song? All right, come on. So we're going to close. I'm going to pray, and then these guys are going to lead us out with a song. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for everybody who's here tonight. God, I just pray that your word would penetrate our hearts, me more than anybody. Lord, I need you in so many areas of my life. I feel so bad sometimes. I should know more. I, I should take more action. I should be more of a doer. But your word, this study in the book of James is taking me. I can see it. I can feel it. I pray, Father, that this powerful book will change all of our lives. And that those that are here will keep coming back consistently. This is a unique church that you've put together for very unique people. If this is their church, Lord, speak to them. Speak to their hearts in the evening. And tell them what you've done here for them. And if not, Lord, I pray that you bless them where they go. Fill us with your Holy Spirit now, Father. And from Sunday to Sunday, carry us through with successful days that are invested in you and your will for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.